This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've seen the headlines and heard the news reports out of Afghanistan. But for some Connecticut residents, the stories of thousands of Afghans trying to catch the last U.S. military plane out of the country are too raw, too difficult to hear. It's their family members the news media and officials are referencing. Today, where we live, we talk to people who are trying to help their loved ones flee their homeland, now under Taliban rule. Coming up, we'll also hear from local refugee resettlement agencies about the work they're doing to help recent arrivals here in Connecticut. First, the State Department says 123,000 people have been evacuated by President Biden's August 31st deadline. But according to CNN, U.S. officials have not said how many of them were Afghans eligible for a special visa for their work helping the U.S. military in the 20-year war. My next guest has family members still in Afghanistan trying to flee, and some of them are eligible for this special immigrant visa, also known as the SIV. On the phone with me now is Aaron Sarwar. He's a West Hartford resident. His family owns the Shish Kebab House restaurant, and he's also a captain in the Connecticut Air National Guard. Aaron, welcome to our show. Good morning. So you have told us that you still have family in Afghanistan. And so can you describe what the last couple of weeks have been like for you and, and how are your relatives doing there? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's been quite difficult. Um, right when we got news that, that Kabul fell, I mean, I think it was kind of a shock uh, how, how quick it happened. But, it, you know, I, obviously it was, just, it was just a shock. And um, a lot of family were caught off guard. Um, so immediately my phone started ringing. Um, you know, it's my, my mother and father calling me basically saying, hey, you know, just, just about the family that's calling. And then I, I got in touch with them. So it's been, it's been quite, um, quite a challenge just, just trying to, um, just trying to, trying to help them out. We, we did apply for the, uh, the visas, but there's just, there's so, it's just the, the numbers are just so massive. There's so many people that want to get out. And, um, just, yeah, just talking to them, going back and forth emails. Um, so that's, that's what it's been like the last few weeks. Mm. I'm so sorry to hear about all the stress that your family is under. Uh, can you talk about how many of, of your family are still in Afghanistan right now? Um, well, there's, there's, there's about 20 members of the family that I'm actually working with. I've been actively, um, working with to try to get them out. Um, so those, you know, it's about half of them are on my mom and the other, the other half of my dad's side. Mm. Tell us about some of them. Obviously we won't use their names, uh, for uh, their safety, but can you describe them and the work that they did for the U S military? Um, well, one of them actually did, uh, he did a lot of work driving, basically, uh, driving convoys and also uh, working security. He's basically been working with the U S for the last 15 years. So he's done a, a multitude of things from driving, uh, armored vehicles to providing security to, you know, translating all sorts of stuff. Um, and then the, one of the other family members actually worked on Ariana television, which was a U.S. USA project. Um, he was, uh, he actually had a show on, on Ariana television, which was a national, uh, a national, um, channel. And, uh, there's, there's plenty of, plenty of episodes where they actually, um, ridiculed and made fun of, um, the, the insurgent groups. So he's actually, he's in hiding right now. Actually, both, uh, the individual that that's going to be on, on air is actually hiding right now, as well as, um, as well as the, the one from Ariana television, um, because everybody knows his face. I mean, he's, he's actually having a real hard time right now. Mm. Uh, you referenced a, a cousin uh, that we hope to be hearing from uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, we're still waiting on that call, Aaron. Uh, but when I referenced earlier this program, the SIV, or Special Immigrant Visa Program, that might be new to some listeners, but this program's actually existed for a long time. I know it helped uh, many uh, Rockies uh, who helped the U.S. Uh, military, and again, it was extended to Afghans as well. Uh, and so if you could just describe that program for our listeners who may not uh, know a lot about it. Uh, sorry, you said just a brief overview of it? or Yeah, just a brief overview of the SIV program. Uh, so yeah, the SIV program, I mean, there's, there's actually, a, it, it's broken up into like, there, there's different priorities like P1, P2, and then the, you know, the SIV, which I would call like the blanket. Um, they, it, it's for folks who have, who have helped, um, who have helped in, in, um, in projects or directly help as DOD contractors, 
as translators or, or you know, have just basically been involved in the reconstruction or, or anything like that, and who may now be facing, um, you know, just facing real, real, like, well, I guess in the past it wasn't as difficult. Like they weren't, they weren't facing the threat they're facing now where, where, you know, the Taliban's basically knocking on their door. But, um, but still we were, we were, we had this program available to folks who, um, who maybe had helped us in the past and were now in like a village or in, in an area that was, you know, Taliban controlled and we wanted to get them out. It was available to them. So they'd apply. Um, it would take, I believe the timeline was like six months to a year and a half or so. Um, and they would get a visa. A, it, it called a P1 or P2 visa, and then that would allow them to come to the U.S. Mm. And again, uh, so many uh, eligible for that program, and um, the reports from the media and from federal officials, uh, they haven't been able to say how many have been able to be evacuated that are eligible. But uh, Aaron, uh, many people from West Hartford uh, know you and your family. Again, I mentioned you own uh, Shish Kebab House, and I believe you own the Hartford City Football Club as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your family's roots and how they arrived here? Uh, so my family actually came to this country um, undocumented. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's not that in the past I would I, I I felt very uncomfortable saying it, but I, I wear that quite proudly nowadays. Um, my family moved here in about 83, 84 during the communist rule when Afghanistan had a communist regime in place. My family was actually a loyalist to the, to the Dawood Khan regime, which was the one prior. And, um, once the communists took over, they had to flee. Uh, a lot of my family was arrested and, um, soon after being released because they were trying to like, uh, there's a period of reconciliation and, and my family just saw the writing on the wall and they had to get out. So they initially went to New Delhi, India. And that's actually where my mom and dad met, believe it or not. My dad had actually fled for um, uh, because he would, he'd gotten conscripted by the uh, communist military. So that was why he had left uh, and ended up meeting my mother in New Delhi. Um, and I'll actually uh, throw in another uh, snippet. My father is the one that um, linked my mom's family uh, with the folks that provided the visas, well, um, fake, fictitious visas to come to the U.S. And uh, decided to come along because uh, my mother, uh, you know, caught his eye. So um, they came to JF. They flew into JFK. Um, did only knew a few words of English, um, but they 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 found a house on St. Charles Street in West Hartford. Uh, I actually was initially raised in a house with about 20 people in it. Um, you know, just you know, just working whatever jobs. My family was working whatever jobs they could. Um, all gathered their money together and opened up the shish kebab house, which has now been open for 33 years. I was a year old when they opened it initially on Franklin Ave in Hartford and it's been in West Hartford center now for, for many years, mm-hmm. um, which me and my sister now, uh, manage, but yeah, that's, that's like my family story in a nutshell. Um, and I'm actually running for town council this year in West Hartford, um, unaffiliated. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my life in a nutshell <laughs> for you. It's always interesting to hear uh, the story of immigrants, and thank you, Aaron, for sharing that. Uh, we're still waiting to hear uh, from your cousin, but when we talk about um, your efforts uh, to help uh, 20 relatives who are still in Afghanistan, how have you been working with uh, our congressional delegation um, and to assist in uh, you know this request to, to get family out of Afghanistan? Yeah, I actually reached out to um, U.S. Senator Blumenthal's office, and they were they were uh, quite helpful. Um, his office was actually able to to help expedite um, the P two visas I applied for, and uh, those those still have not come through. But we are uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping they come through soon. Um, so those applications are in, and um, you know uh, Senator Blumenthal's office has been in touch with me, and they actually re- recently emailed me. Uh, just checking in and letting me know that you know that they are they are being expedited, but um, you know we'll, we'll see. Time will tell. So mm. uh, we know that uh, we have uh, listeners who wonder, you know, how they can help. Coming up, we're going to hear from two local refugee resettlement agencies in the state of Connecticut helping to uh, resettle Afghan families in our state. But Aaron, what would you tell listeners who've been watching this story? They, they may not have a connection to Afghanistan, but, uh, you know, they're concerned and they know uh, that people are fearing for their lives and they want to help. What would you say to them? Uh, I would say thank you for all the, the, the thoughts and prayers. I mean, my, I mean, just, just, just in my friends group, I can't, I can't even count how many, how many messages and phone calls, um, Facebook, my Facebook just, you 
you know, a lot of people messaging me. Um, just appreciate all the all the love and support for the Afghan community. Um, I would say, you know, reach out to like the Red Cross. I know the Red Cross is quite involved right now. They're they're providing food and and um, and blankets and clothes for a lot of a lot of refugees coming in. There's tons of um, nonprofits out there that are assisting with the with all the refugees that are coming into the country. So just reach out to you know the, all the organizations that we all that we all you know that that are always involved, and uh, I'm sure you can find a way to help. Um, You've been here. I know for sure that the. I know for sure the Red Cross has been helping. You've been hearing Aaron Sarwar, again, a West Hartford resident. His family owns Shish Kebab House in West Hartford. Uh, he and others trying uh, desperately to help family uh, in Afghanistan. They're trying to get out. Uh, Aaron was able to connect us with a cousin who was still in Afghanistan. This family member was an engineer. He fixed IT and radio equipment for the U.S. Army. He's joining us now on the phone. Sir, can you hear me? Abdullah? Hello. 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 You're on the radio here in Connecticut. We just spoke to Aaron Sarwar. We understand that uh, you are his cousin and you're still in Afghanistan. Can you describe what the last few days have been like for you? Hello. Hello. Can you hear yes. us? Dear madam. Yes, dear madam. I'm in uh, Afghanistan now. I'm stuck with in 2002 in, in America company in Afghanistan and USAID, and I have resigned my position in the UN, and I was in the UN working, but I will do because I can't return to resign, and I was in, in Afghanistan, I left work with the company of uh, USAID, and then I'm working very hard, and then until 2012, after that, the project finished, and all of a sudden started again company in the US also, military. And now I'm in a very bad position in Afghanistan. I'm in the basement. I know how it food. I know how it anything with my church. All the time, my my kids is cry and they call me because I'm communication and radio technician. And also, I have responsibility of the whole of IT department. Everybody know me. Everybody know me. I left about two, three times in the airport. Nobody can help me. Nobody can ask me. Nobody can fool me. But some family I have in Connecticut, we have in the line, Colonel, I will keep time by time contact with me, say, Uncle, please wait, I will contact with the base, he will help you. But me, he will tend to talk to me, but nobody from the base is not calling me. I left to the, the airport, the, the glass, and one hat in my head, and nobody understanding my heart. Nobody understands. I'm so sorry. I'm in a very, very bad position and now in Afghanistan. And nobody can help me. That's why I'm going in here. And also, the another problem for me, please, please, for Connecticut people in the US, people for God, help me, can take me, my family, and me, and can take me from that very bad life from Afghanistan. And sir, sir, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, for our listeners, uh, we're all, he's joining us on uh, a cell phone, so it might be a little hard to understand, but uh, he and his family uh, went to the airport in Kabul, uh, tried to uh, be among the many who evacuated and was turned away, and so now uh, he is in hiding. And uh, again, we heard from Aaron Sarwar, who is a cousin, who was trying to help. Uh, Aaron, uh, you know, it's so hard to, to hear from from your cousin to hear the stress that um, he is under um, in, in in hiding right now in Afghanistan. Um, what can you tell our listeners about um, what he also experienced uh, in those last couple of days? Um, yeah, I could tell you. So when, when you, he, he went, yeah, he went to the airport uh, multiple okay. times, and uh, I know that you know they they basically. I believe a couple members of the family actually got hit by uh, by by the Taliban uh, guards that they had outside outside the airport. Uh, so they like sent me pictures, and I mean, he, so he had some friends that were hurt um, at at the attacks. So, I mean, it's it's been it's been pretty uh, pretty stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, multiple times I actually, you know, I told him like, hey, just just go there. You know, your applications in. We're we're trying to get you. You know, like your your PT applications in. You know, just see if you can somehow get through because he had heard like a lot of people had gotten through, and that's when he tried to go, and they they just they they turned him they had turned him back multiple times, and, and a couple of times you know you know waved uh, 
you know, whatever, whatever they're being people with, they, you know, I guess struck, struck some of the family members. So it's been, it's been pretty stressful. Yeah. And I imagine you're spending a lot of time on the phone uh, trying to help him and other relatives. You mentioned reaching out uh, to Senator Blumenthal's office. We also reached out to Senator Mur- Chris Murphy's office. A congressional aide uh, told where we live that uh, his office has worked on more than 100 cases for Connecticut residents who've reached out to the office regarding family members who remain in Afghanistan, and they're going to continue working with the State Department. Uh, Aaron Sarwar, thank you for sharing a, b- a little bit about your family's story. And thank you to your cousin for calling us from Afghanistan to share um, what he's been dealing with the past couple of days. Of course, we wish him all the best and we hope that he and his family uh, can be evacuated soon. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to share, you know, share share the stories and, um, and just, you know, shed some light on what's going on. So thank you. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. Uh, Coming up, we're going to hear from local resettlement agencies working to help Afghan families get to Connecticut safely. And you may be wondering how you can help, too. So we'll take your questions, your calls at 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Refugee resettlement agencies help new arrivals restart their lives, and they've been extremely busy in recent weeks, helping clients who needed assistance getting back to the states, as well as welcoming new families. Joining us now on Zoom is Anne O'Brien, Director of Community Engagement at the Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, known as IRIS, based in New Haven. And welcome to the show. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks for having us. Now, we know over the last five years, IRIS has welcomed uh, more than 500 refugees from Afghanistan. But in this last uh, couple of weeks, uh, tell us about the work that you're doing and and how many families you've been able to help. So, um, yes, that's true. Over the last five years, we've welcomed over 500 individuals from Afghanistan, a mixture of um, individuals who were special immigrant visa holders that was mentioned earlier, individuals and their families who worked for the U.S. military, as well as other categories of more general refugees, also from Afghanistan. But the volume picked up in August uh, because of the U.S. withdrawal, and we have received six families for a total of 40 individuals that have come as part of the evacuations that have been taking place. So on August 4th, our agency and every agency, including Um, Siri, who's on the line, and the other agencies around the country were put on 24-hour notice, which is short notice even for resettlement agencies, to be ready to receive families and to welcome them into our communities as they were being evacuated and then taken to a military base in the U.S., and then literally within inside of 24 hours brought out to the community. So um, we have been welcoming those families just as we welcome our other families with um, warm food from their home country and finding them a home as quick as humanly possible. When these families show up on 24 hours notice though, we have to either put them in hotels um, or make arrangements with individuals that they already know. Some of them have family members or people that they worked with back in Afghanistan. And sometimes those individuals want the family to stay with them. And in this situation in particular, that is perfectly fine with us. But otherwise we put them in a hotel until we can find them their own apartment and get it furnished and move them into some stability. So that's what we've been doing on the welcoming side. It is um, emotionally challenging. Um, These folks are coming from an active conflict zone. And so that's a little different for our agency, but we're familiar with it. Um, On the other side, we have been trying to work with our families that just like your other guest earlier today, um, Aaron Sarwar, so many of those that we have resettled before this month have literally 30 and 40 fit family members each that they are they fear for their lives now. And so we have been trying to help those individuals file for the humanitarian category as well as P2 
And so our legal team has had to both retool as well as bring in volunteers from other legal firms to help file those forms to try to get those individuals, um, if at all humanly possible, to safety. And then last but absolutely not least, we had many, over 100 of our own clients <clears throat> who had traveled to Afghanistan at the beginning of the summer because they were either legal permanent residents of the U.S., <clears throat> excuse me, or U.S. citizens, and they felt that it was safe. They had come here five and six years ago, um, had established their residency in the U.S. We had re resettled them, and they wanted to go back after so many years for a major family event, a, a big wedding, a funeral, um, or to see a grandmother that was close to passing. And so they'd gone back at the beginning of the summer because they too believed that the Afghan government was stable enough. However, um, we still have uh, 11 families that are trapped in Afghanistan that are our clients. Over the past month, we have had our staff uh, repurposed a small group of them, um, ESL teachers, as well as some, some of the members of our health team that have been in daily contact with these family members over WhatsApp and texting to try to identify their location, whether or not they're safe, to provide them some emotional support. And then we have been working with various contacts on the ground directly to provide them guidance as best we can get it to get to an escort to get to the airport when they get those emails from the State Department. And just as Aaron described, sometimes they're, they were able to make it and roughly 60 individuals were actually able to, through this process that we had managed to piece together, were able to make it onto airplanes and to get out of Afghanistan. Some are in Germany making their way to the US, some are in other countries, um, but there are still 11 of our families that are in hiding in various places. We're staying in contact with them. Some of them have family members still here in the US. It's oftentimes that the father stayed back in the US to keep working and the mother and children went back to see family. So we're also now hearing from teachers in New Haven and other cities who are wanting us to be sure that we know that children uh, that they had in their classroom didn't show up to the first day of school. And they know these kids are from Afghanistan. And so we're telling them that we're aware and we are still actively trying to get them out. It's really hard to hear these 11 families, as you mentioned, uh, mostly mothers and children that are in hiding, Anne. It is hard. And each day I wake up and uh, I think I can handle this today. And I'm not even the one, Lucy, that's communicating with these folks directly. I do see the notes um, because I want to try to keep track of um, how many individuals we have over there, over there, as well as there are a number of us that have been the go-betweens um, regarding this effort and our congressional offices. I cannot say enough about the good that the staff of our congressional representatives and offices have been doing. Um, all of them, Blumenthal, Himes, Murphy, Larson, DeLauro, um, if I'm forgetting any, they have been an incredible support to our staff, to our clients through this time. And their staff have just been working around the clock to make sure that we have all the contacts and support we can possibly have. You're hearing Anne O'Brien here on Where We Live, Director of Community Engagement for IRIS, that's Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, based in New Haven, about uh, the, the people with ties to Connecticut, uh, Afghans uh, who had been resettled here, uh, that traveled back uh, this summer, and some that have un been unable to leave the country now that it's an active conflict zone and mothers and children uh, in hiding. Uh, and uh, you've also been able uh, to welcome some new arrivals. Can you talk about those families that have been sent to Connecticut and, and how many of them are, um, are children? Sure. Um, so just as is typical with um, a lot of our Afghan families, roughly 75% are women and children. So these are individuals, just like my upbringing from a Missouri Catholic background, they love lots of kids and it's wonderful. There are um, probably, I would say, you know, 75% of those are children um, and really young children under the age of 12 or 13. 
So um, it's a, it's definitely a, a family-oriented um, culture. And uh, there have been a couple of um, solo males, um, special immigrant visa holders, that have come on their own. They do have colleagues here um, in the New Haven or Hartford area that we've been able to connect with them. And um, it's good to see that in that situation that those individual uh, males, that they have some support as well. Um, but, you know, they're all incredibly strong, just such resilience in these folks. They have uh, really not just fought, but thought for years and decades about how they could be a part of rebuilding their country. And it's amazing to me to see them come to the U.S. and to still be able to process a feeling of joy and safety. Um, I guess I expected that the loss of their country and seeing it collapse so quickly, but to see it collapse again to the Taliban, I guess I thought, silly, um, that it would dampen their resilience. And it just doesn't seem to. Mm. They are so relieved to be safe, to have their kids be able to go to school soon. And they generally, when you ask them, how are you feeling? And they're saying, I, I, I'm just so happy to be here. And they're saying that genuinely. Um, we also know that refugees go through a cycle. And so often when they first come here, they do have that sense of euphoria. And we know that at a certain point, things will begin to settle in for them and that those other feelings will become more prominent. And so we will be there for them when that happens as well. And we are trying to bulk up our staff and services to be able to be there, particularly for these individuals that are, again, coming to us from a, directly from a conflict zone. Uh, speaking of some of the new arrivals, uh, Connecticut Public's uh, housing reporter Kamila Bajejo uh, covered uh, the night a group of Afghan refugees arrived at Iris in New Haven recently. Kamila, welcome to the show. Hi, Lucy. Thank you for having me. Uh, we heard uh, Anne uh, talk about uh, some of the new arrivals, uh, some uh, women and children, but also uh, solo uh, males. You actually spoke to uh, someone uh, named Narula. Can you tell us about him? Yeah, absolutely. So Narula was the solo traveler of a group of seven. Um, he came uh, from Kandahar. Uh, he told me that he traveled over 30 hours. And while he was exhausted, he was very excited um, to be in New Haven and to be in Connecticut and to rebuild a new life. Um, he, he mentioned that he was just um, really thankful to be safe and really thankful to the American government for letting him um, come to America. He had applied for um, a special immigration visa like we've been talking about in 2017 um, and it was finally approved um, this year um, so he, he just thought it was the, the, the right time to to come over um, but you know he, he did leave uh, a good portion of his family behind so so it was it was exciting but also troubling because you know he he mentioned that the, the situation in, in Afghanistan is it ideal for his family. We have a, a clip from an interview you did with him. Uh, let's hear it. I'm feeling well. I like it so because my life is safe. So much appreciated for the government. They give it to me the chance to come inside America. All Afghanistan situation is going down. Taliban is take the capital of Kabul. I cannot do nothing for my family. So he's talking about some of the family that were left behind, Camila? Yeah, absolutely. So it was, um, you know, his parents, his brothers. Uh, he mentioned uh, that day that the last conversation he had was actually in the airport. Um, and, and his parents were asking him how um, Kabul airport was at the moment. And he said he didn't, he didn't really notice um, any commotions just because he was already on the plane. But he understood um, why, why there was so much anxiety at the moment and why so many people uh, like him wanted to, to leave Afghanistan. Now, he was traveling alone, but you were able to be there and see that he was greeted by a friend, someone who'd been resettled here a few years ago, uh, welcoming him uh, with a smile and a promise of a good home-cooked meal. Tell us about what it was like to, to see that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when Narula arrived, um, 
he immediately hugged his friend. It was a friend of a friend, actually. Um, they knew each other through uh, a, a common uh, work colleague. Um, so I think it was, it, it was exciting just to see a new face and, and someone who uh, was welcoming, welcoming him with open arms. Um, and, you know, the friend was also a, a refugee that came five years ago in a similar situation. Um, and he mentioned that he was really grateful to Iris because they took him under, under their wing. And he, and he mentioned it was like they were his mother and father. Um, and, you know, he, he was just excited to have Narula. He was talking about the meal he had at home for him, that they were going to have beef and chicken kebab. Um, so it, it was just really a, a, a very heartwarming moment um, to know that when Narula left, he was, he was going to start a new life. Now, uh, we've been talking with Anne O'Brien uh, in the New Haven, uh, Iris, uh, and I'm wondering uh, for that part of the state, the Bridgeport area, you know, what are some other organizations that are stepping up to help uh, refugees with housing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now, housing, um, especially housing affordability in Connecticut, is a bit tough. Uh, uh, rents are up by 12 percent, and the average rent is about 1800 <laughs> 1800. Um, so, you know, that's a hefty price for a lot of residents in Connecticut already, let alone someone who's new to the area and might not know the language. So, um, like we mentioned, uh, refugee resettlement agencies are trying their best to find housing, um, but other organizations are also stepping in. For example, the University of Bridgeport and Goodwin College um, have offered up a dorm with 140 beds uh, to temporarily house um, refugees. I think uh, a, a lot of uh, organizations in Connecticut recognize the housing situation. Um, so I think moving forward, as we welcome more uh, refugees, if, if people know of um, independent and affordable um, housing options, I think, you know, letting uh, the resettlement agencies know would be really helpful. Uh, we were talking with Iris. Uh, also with us on Zoom is uh, Martine Dirt, who's a Refugee Services Program Manager for the Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, which is based in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Martine, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I, I imagine that you and your team are doing a very similar things that we heard Anne O'Brien outline. So tell me uh, what your organization, how many Afghan uh, families um, are you trying to help uh, come to our state? So we uh, have agreed to receive 100 uh, Afghan individuals to come. We so far have not yet received um, any. We do know of 10 that are currently in Pennsylvania uh, and will be coming in the next week. They should be arriving and we have learned um, of their arrival through families that were resettled here with us. I echo many of the words that Anne uh, has mentioned since we share a lot of our works together uh, and services. But so we have been really concentrating on meeting with the Afghan families that were resettled here, um, providing some cash management for them, emotional support, uh, definitely assisting them in applying for um, the correct visas for them. We are working with uh, pro bono immigration as well that can help since there are so many applications. I was provided 250 names just in one day. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, already two weeks ago. So there's so many Afghans that are there that are not able to go out uh, and who struggle to find the correct visa. Fortunately, we also did learn that we had four families uh, that became U.S. citizen and that had gone back to Afghanistan, but they were just able to uh, return home uh, as of two days ago. They are all back here in Connecticut. Um, so at least that was uh, great news. We still have two families that are in Kabul right now and that have not returned. And we have one um, that is in Spain that was not able to come directly back to the US, but uh, at least uh, she will, she and her children will be back. For services, we, um, you know, as Camila have said, uh, we actually worked with uh, Goodwin University. We visited it yesterday. We looked at all of their dorms. We looked at the housing that's available. Uh, we've been working a lot with the housing authorities. We are finding house. This is 
the first and most important act that we have been doing was uh, making sure that we had housing set up. As I mentioned, we really have a very short uh, turnaround time. And so, you know, just to get a notice of 24 hours is really short. So we wanted to make sure that we had housing secured so that we could just have these houses set for Afghans. And as well, of course, I mean, we continue to receive uh, refugees so for us, it is about setting up house for everybody that is still coming. Last night, we received Syrian refugees. Um, and so it is still working and balancing the act of, you know, working with the crisis and the imminent arrival versus working with the refugees whom we do know are arriving. Martin, Martin, I understand that your organization, again, Siri, Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, also helped settle Afghan refugees in our state who fled Soviet occupation in the 80s. Uh, when we see news coverage that, you know, the, the, the U.S. military mission has ended, the military planes that we saw, uh, you know, trying to evacuate so many people in those last few days. Now that it's ended, you know, how can some of these families get out of Af Afghanistan? What are the logistics involved there? It's really difficult. Uh, there's no promise of anything, and that I think is the hardest part. Um, everybody is applying, so there is the humanitarian parole, which everybody can apply for a humanitarian parole. Uh, there is a 50-50% chance that one gets approved for a humanitarian parole. There is, of course, the SIV, but if you're just starting the SIV process, it will take a long time. Um, there are a lot of people who are actually leaving or trying to leave Kabul to go to a, another destination and apply for refugee status or even SIV or P2 from that uh, other country. And mostly we are seeing um, that a lot of people have gone through Turkey, a lot of people are going to Iran. Um, it's they are not the easiest countries to apply for any visa. So it, it's it's difficult. It is really difficult to say. And this is why we are working with immigration lawyers. They know best. Uh, it's definitely not my area. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Siri, your organization, you've been working with Congressman uh, Jim Himes' office. Uh, Patrick Malone, his spokesman, uh, told Where We Live that they flagged 702 individuals for the Department of State that included American citizens, uh, people with green cards, uh, SIVs, and these P1 and P2s that we've heard mentioned. And about 270 of those individuals had some Connecticut connection. Uh, and so it'll be uh, interesting to see uh, how many uh, Afghan families uh, end up resettling uh, in our state uh, over the next few weeks and months. Uh, I want to thank you, Martin Dirt, again, Refugee Services Program Manager for the Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, for talking about your work. And for listeners who want to help and want to reach you, what's the best way to do so? So definitely uh, you may contact us at uh, Siri. I can definitely uh, give you the phone number is 203-336-0141. And you can definitely ask for Martine. Otherwise, we also uh, have set up relief funds online on our website. So you can definitely also look on our websites. We offer um, for gift cards to be purchased or for people who are offering housing, they are able to contact us through that or by email. Email is a little bit uh, more difficult with my name, but it would be M and then D-H-E-R-T-E at CRECT.org. And thank you, Martine. We will make sure that we share that information on our website, wrctpublic.org slash where we live. And O'Brien, uh, just 30 seconds left. Uh, the same question for people who want to reach out to Iris to help. Uh, what's the best way to do so? Right. So the easiest way is to go to our homepage, irisct, so irisct.org. And we have three different main ways that people can help us right now that are listed there. One of the key things we wanted to mention is that we are working with community groups that are forming around the state, outside of New Haven and outside of Hartford, to be able to welcome refugee families to their towns. We did this before in 2016 with the Syrian crisis, and we want to make sure that everybody in Connecticut has a chance to help. And so by joining a community group that are being trained and worked and organized, by folks in your own town, 
you'll be able to participate in that initiative. So definitely go to our website and then go to community co-sponsorship and you can sign up there to get connected with a local group that's closest to you that is training up to receive a family. Thank you, Anne O'Brien with IRIS. We appreciate your time and work. And also thanks to Camila Bajejo, housing reporter for Connecticut Public, for joining us today. Uh, Coming up, we're going to continue talking about Afghanistan and hear from another Connecticut resident with ties to that country. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've been focusing off on Afghanistan today, hearing from Connecticut residents who are worried about their relatives still in Afghanistan, also finding out ways that uh, people can help in our state. Joining us now on Zoom is Miriam Wardock, who's a second-generation Afghan-American living in our state. Miriam, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Lucy. Thank you for having me here. Uh, first off, how are you doing? I understand you still have relatives in Afghanistan. I do. I, I have lots of family members um, that live in rural areas as well as in the in the Kabul city region. Um, you know, it's it's um, you're you're always filled with lots of emotions, um, and watching what's happening, sort of, you know, you relive some of the, the trauma of like escaping, being a refugee, thinking about nine eleven, um, thinking about just resettlement and being an immigrant and starting your life over. So there's a lot of different feelings and emotions. But I would say I'm very optimistic and I'm very hopeful. Um, And um, even just last night, there was a group of uh, young Afghan Americans. We got together to look at ways that we can systematically help the new refugees. And we were on a Zoom call with Chris George from um, IRIS. Um, And so we're hoping to move on with a plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of your relatives that uh, you're worried about is your sister, I understand, is an, attor- an attorney. Um, have you been able to talk with her, and um, you know, how is she handling this, this situation? Um, I have. Um, I think, um, so my sister, as an attorney, um, she has always had this moral and ethical um, you know, code and compass in her, and she's always believed in anti-corruption, and that's always been her work in Afghanistan. Um, I think that um, being an Afghan woman as well, she's very resilient and has seen a number of different uh, things that have happened uh, in the last 20 years in that country. Um, so um, I am worried in, in the sense of just what's to come and anxious um, uh, because it's it's a shift of power. Um, but I also believe that, um, you know, uh, she... Um, you know, will continue to to do what's right um, and uh, just see what happens um, with this new government. Mm. I understand that she was just a child when your parents came to Connecticut as refugees uh, during the Soviet occupation. Uh, And uh, you shared with our producer that uh, your sister remembers the beauty of of Afghanistan and she wanted to go back and help. And that was, uh, you know, such a a passion for her. Uh, For listeners, uh, we know that the situation in Afghanistan is very complicated. What do you want uh, other Americans to know about the country and about its future? Um, but that's a really good question. Um, uh, I would love to have people look at um, this country as what's not being presented usually in the media, where it's, everything is ravished with war. And it has been. That's been the reality. But there's so many beautiful parts of Afghanistan, and, and the people are just so wonderful, and they're so diverse, and um, they're so hospitable. And... Um, at the end of the day, everybody just wants to live in peace so that they can have, um, you know, they can they can move the country towards, um, you know, rebuilding and being able to provide their children a better opportunity in a better country. Um, and so I, I, I feel like at the end of the day, uh, to just to humanize the people that are, you know, in Afghanistan. What do you want to hear from U.S. officials in the next few weeks and months? Certainly a lot of criticism about how the whole withdrawal was handled. 
Um, well, it's this. This has been an, an ongoing conflict um, beyond, you know, even some officials. I think that we've we've looked at this region uh, for at least the last forty years, if not more, as an area where there's been a lot of proxy wars. There's been a lot of um, um, you know, um, conflict over resources, over uh, governance. Um, and so my hope is um, just to give the Afghan people a chance, whether it's coming here to resettle and being able to help with those folks um, or the folks back at home. Well, we want to thank you for joining us today, Miriam, and uh, for your sister and for your other relatives. We hope uh, that they remain safe. Uh, and just in the couple minutes we have left, uh, do you hope that your sister is able uh, t- to get out of Afghanistan uh, and to remain safe until things get stabilized? I I hope so, and I and I hope that that's my wish for everybody there, um, including all my other family members. Um, and I, I also pray that um, that there's a, a peace and opportunities for women to be able to be part of that peace process, but also be part of the rebuilding process in Afghanistan. Miriam Mordock, again, is a Connecticut resident. She's a second generation Afghan American. Miriam, thank you. And we'll keep you and your family in our thoughts. Thank you. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Sujata Srinivasan produced today's show. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. We hope you have a great weekend. Thank you.